probably have people join. All right, good morning, everyone. This meeting of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee for July 26 is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, which were extended. I don't have the reference um, by the legislature on July 16th. Uh, please note this meeting is being recorded and all attendees are participating via Zoom is posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Um, let's see here. So this meeting will feature public comment if any is offered. Um, Please be aware other people may be able to see you and take care not to share your device's screen and please silence all phones and devices. Uh, members of the public wishing to participate must use their full name for Zoom access. And um, we will do a roll call. Um, but before we do that, I just want to remind everybody we have some new members. Uh, so welcome to Joe Topham from the Planning Board, Rachel Freeman from the Land Bank, and Christy Kickham from the uh, Capital Program Committee. Uh, I don't see Christy on the screen at the moment. Uh, so we will go ahead with the roll call. Uh, Gary Beller. You're on mute, Gary. Present. Thank you. Sarah Boyce. Here. Peter Brace told us he would not be able to attend today. Matt Fee. Here. Rachel Freeman. Here. Ian Golding. Yes. Jen Carberg. Here. Uh, as I mentioned, I don't see Christy Kickham. I don't see Joanna Roach, um, Joe Topham. Here. And Mary Longacre. Um, so thank you all for attending this morning. Uh, just a reminder that um, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. Uh, please wait for the chair to recognize you before speaking. And uh, that is an abbreviated version of the announcements because I'm sure we could all memorize those um, with very little prompting at this point. Uh, so the first item on the agenda is um, nomination election of chair, vice chair, and secretary. I wanna uh, preface that by saying thank you um, for the opportunity to have been chair for the last three years. Um, very happy to have served in that capacity. Um, but more than willing to consider others who may want to uh, serve as chair. Um, please don't um, hesitate to offer your name if that interests you. Um, and uh, do we have anyone who wants to nominate someone for the position of chair? Ian? Uh, so Mary, uh, I think you've done a very good job and uh, so I would be happy to nominate you for a second term if uh, you feel that isn't too masochistic. <laughs> Thank and you, I, Matt. And I will second it. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Uh, well, you can any, say no. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other nominations? <laughs> right. I would third for Mary, even though we don't need a third. <laughs> All right, well, let me just go to a roll call vote then, since that appears to be the trend. Uh, so Gary Beller? Aye. Sarah Boyce? Aye. Peter Bray, uh, Peter, sorry. Uh, Matt Fee? Aye. Rachel Freeman? Aye. Ian Golding? Aye. Jen Carper? Aye. Joe Topham? Aye. And Mary Longacre? Aye. <laughs> Just to make it unanimous. Um, uh, okay, so do we sorry, have nominated? Uh, yeah, Peter. Uh, Congratulations. Sorry. Thank you, <laughs> Or sympathies, depends. <laughs> um, so do we have nominations for vice chair? Uh, if I can interrupt for one second. Um, I've communicated with Peter Brace. He, we knew he wouldn't be here today. I've also double checked on this. Uh, there is no issue uh, if he wanted to put his name forward. I asked him if he did, and he said he didn't have any issue with putting his name forward um, as, as the case may need or not. Okay, so we'll consider that as uh, Peter indicating his willingness to be nominated. Are there any other nominations? I nominate Peter Brace officially for vice chair. Yeah. <laughs> Second. All right. If there are no other nominations, a roll call vote for Peter Brace for vice chair. Gary Beller. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Rachel Freeman. Rachel, you're on mute. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. I'll get better at that. Yeah. In building. Aye. Jen Carberg. Aye. Joe Topham. Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. And finally, secretary. Do we have any nominations for secretary? Sure. Peter in his absence, you know. Uh, um, I, he did not indicate a willingness for that. Oh, yeah. oh wow. Well. 
Okay, so if we have no nominations, Vince has uh, graciously offered to take today's minutes and we are going to look for uh, a solution to that issue. Okay, so uh, also uh, while we're on the subject of the membership in the committee, I did not repeat this in the agenda, um, but just to make that formal announcement, um, the town did assign the one year, two year and three year at large seats. Uh, one year was assigned to me, two years was assigned to Sarah Boyce, and three years was assigned to Joanna Roach. So just so everybody's aware of that. Um, all right, the next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes from June 28th. Vince, if you would put those up on the screen. Uh, we did try to correct the spelling of uh, uh, Christina Mejina's name. Uh, there's no R in her last name. Um, Gary, you have a question? I did have a question, not on the minutes, but uh, with respect to the at-large, did the town indicate the terms? I think I thought they were different. Yes, I, I just went through those. I have oh, a okay. one-year term, Sarah has two, and Joanna has three. Oh, okay, thank you. I missed that. No. Uh, any comments on the minutes from June 28th? Uh, if I can just briefly, um, I corrected one spelling mistake throughout. Um, one uh, small uh, correction in here that uh, where I assisted with um, uh, a, C, uh, a grant with, um, uh, what are they called again, MVP. And um, Leah was in charge of that minor correction there. Um, and I corrected a spelling error uh, there for Malika Conservation Association uh, for their um, acronym. I think that was pretty much it. Um, and this is something that's now later in the agenda. Um, so we can move on from that if you wish. Yep. All right, so if there are no other comments or corrections to the minutes, we'll take a motion to approve. Move approval. Thank you, Matt. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, roll call vote, Gary Beller. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Rachel Freeman. Aye. Ian Golding. Aye. Jen Carberg. Aye. Joe Topham. Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, Vince is going to substitute for Morgan Sale. Morgan is actually off today, and so he will have a brief report on the erosion monitoring uh, that has been going on on the South Shore, but specifically at Mattica Beach. Yep, so uh, one of the concerns we had was last week there was um, uh, high tide events that were Looked like they might cause some uh, potential erosion. Uh, we had some flooding in the downtown associated with it, but we got lucky because most of the flooding, um, it was, you would call it sunny day flooding. It was um, uh, uh, the moon tide flooding, uh, but it all happened in the middle of the night. So we got lucky uh, on this instance. Um, on the South Shore, it didn't seem to have any impact. Uh, yesterday, I also checked the South Shore with emphasis again on the Madiket area to see if um, these high surf advisories and the, um, uh, the the rip currents are having any effect on erosion. And mercifully, I haven't seen any uh, in my travels and I covered sections of Smith Point, Madica Beach, and I had a look at Cisco as well. Great, thank you, Vince. Uh, any questions or comments on that before we move on? All right, seeing none. Um, Next item on the agenda is the follow-up discussion on the draft letter uh, regarding maintaining public access in coastal erosion environments. So Vince and Ian have been discussing this. Um, Ian, do you want to uh, sort of give us a recap of, of where we're coming from and where we are now on this issue? Um, well, uh, so Vince pointed out that, so, um, so this was, uh, this came about because of an application before the Conservation Commission in 18 Washington Pond Road. And uh, where it's, um, as we all know, on the North Shore, there are a number of properties. And uh, Vince mentioned uh, 25 East Tripstams Avenue, where you basically, you can't access the beach, except sometimes at extreme low tide. And this really, this goes against the public trust doctrine of 1641, 1647 which um, in itself is an aberration uh, from most states, uh, including New York, uh, ownership, public ownership can only go to the high tide line. Massachusetts is one of, is really the only exception as far as I can tell. And 
so when we were, so I asked Vince informally if we could have, uh, if he could draft a letter as, um, and Matt had also chimed in on it last time. Vince then said that there was a sticking point uh, because he felt that it wasn't part of our original charter. And so I guess I would like to focus uh, on that aspect of amending our charter so that we can uh, be in this uh, position to uh, keep an eye on these issues because, you know, both Matt and I go back, I think I go back to 1951. I don't know where you go back to, Matt, in terms of, you know, it, everybody assumed in those days that the beaches were open to all and including landowners, you know, and now of course we have a very different um, generation of landowners. So I think it's, it's important from my point of view to, uh, uh, to go to bat for the public on this issue as much as we can. And then I'm sure Vince can then fill in the gaps I've left there. Uh, yeah, sure, if that's okay, Mary. Go ahead, Vince. So um, I went through the crack charge, which is three years old at this point. There's a couple of, um, you know, crack is very uh, specific and set charge. There's one or two things in the, in the charge that are open-ended. And this is where I thought crack might be able to assist Ian. Um, and the request for the letter. Um, I, I don't mind saying that this might be a bit thin. I don't, I don't know. It, it certainly doesn't get to the point Ian's getting to and Ian's request to look at the charge. But what I was looking at is in the charge, one of the bit bullet points, the fifth bullet point covers reviewing pertinent existing regulations to include coastal resilience accommodations, identify any disconnects, that's in quotations, uh, between regulations and practice and or conflicts and recommend ways to achieve alignment, review proposed pertinent regulations for coastal resiliency purposes. So the word disconnect is what I'm focusing on there. And the disconnect here is, there's a disconnect between the Doctrine of Public Trust, the Wetland Protection Act, and how both of these state level ordinances need to account for how tide lines are defined and how tide lines are changing and quite literally shifting upwards because of sea level rise. There's the disconnect, but it's how do you do that? Um, and that is uh, one of the questions I thought that the committee might want to take up, but perhaps Ian and his request to review the charge might also be a good way to go and I'm just putting the question forward I don't have an answer. Thank you Vince. Matt? I don't think we have to overthink it I just I think a letter to the CONCOM asking them to uh, you know to pay attention to this is it would be a start and and not I don't think we have to get into a lot of legalese and you know what is our charge and how do we change our charge and all that I think this is something that has broad public support uh, it is, uh, it's the traditional use of, uh, of the beaches. It was when the, the proprietors did their first set asides, the first things they set, set aside that was going to remain public was uh, chunks of the beach, roads to the ponds, and a rod or two around each pond. So the original intent was to keep those areas that were in public use, it, remaining in public use. And you know that was sort of why we're somewhat different than the vineyard in the rest of the state. Uh, arguably, the we are not bound by the state. Uh, the town has never taken up that. Well, the town did take it up in regards to the Madigan Ditch and Long Pond, and we won a case there. But basically, what the argument, the short argument, is that the uh, that the town came in from New York to the state of Massachusetts was accepted into, into Massachusetts under the rules and regulations existing at the time, which was New York and the high tide, not the low tide. So, and it was even voted at the legislature that they couldn't take away, you know, sort of rules and, and laws that we already had, that wasn't allowed. And so we've had some arguments, you know, not recently, a hundred years ago, and one on that, uh, I think it's important for us to you know, kind of stay in front of that and, tell, and, and continue talking about how important the beaches are for our economy, for our residents, for the whole island. Uh, and, you know, I, I know I've talked to uh, oh, Julian, Julian and uh, Dylan and both of those guys know the importance. They're trying to put an article through that would 
allow different uses other than just fishing and fowling. I'm not sure that's going to get through the legislature, but you never know. You know, we can support that. So, so on this, so for this, I would say, uh, and this is what what Ian has brought up is one of my pet peeves, where you know, Concom is allowed to ask for this. They, sometimes we were told, oh no, we have to just approve it. But then we had someone from DEP come down and give a presentation. It was either to our group or to Concom. I can't remember who it was. But they said, oh yeah, th you can do that. Look at these stairs that we make them put in in some areas. Look at these stairs. They put those in 30 years after the original structure. So I think that we're headed, you know, I think Ian asking for it is good. I think us putting a letter supporting it. And I think we can tie it to sea level rise, just like Vince just did. That as the sea level rises, regardless of whether there's erosion in these areas, this is going to continue to be an issue. And we recommend that there be a passage on all structures, period. As a general, you know, and, and let, let's see what happens. You know, worst that can happen is they ignore us. That happens to me a lot. So, you know, it's, it's okay. <laughs> so, Thank you, Matt. <laughs> so, oh, so, um, well, you certainly, I don't ignore you, Matt. So, um, but also I think when Matt was referring to the Madigat Ditch and Long Pond, there was another affirmation that uh, New York law took precedence over Massachusetts law at the time that we were absorbed into New York in 1692. And that was uh, that we had control of our own ponds. That was over the licensing, right, Matt? Or is that what you were referring to? That's what I was referring to. And okay. we came in after yeah. the we came in after the public trust doctrine. Right. So, so, you know, we were bound by the rules of New York. Now, it's a tough case and it's easier. That's part of the idea of one big beach was to, uh, you know, sort of do it willingly and let people take tax breaks and just sort of do it ourselves and not end up in a big legal battle over it. But it's still, uh, you know, but, you know, we, it, we, we came in after public trust. We weren't bound by it. Right. Uh, arguably we are or we aren't now, depending who you talk to, so. Thank you. So um, I, I'm curious, uh, mostly from a sort of devil's advocate position, if um, if there's a conservation argument against this. Um, you know, our, our, uh, we are coastal resilience. So is, is there a uh, resilience aspect to um, not maintaining public access to the beach. So, so separate from the, the, you know, the legal aspect, separate from the, the economy and the recreation and the enjoyment that we've always had on the beach. Is there a reason why we would be in favor of not having public access on the beach from a devil's advocate position? Jen? Thanks, Mary. Um, and it's not so much a as I'm listening to the discussion here, it sounds like the ask or the push to CONCOM is for access over structures that are going on the beach, not so much access to all beaches. Um, as I was thinking about this last week, I think that we, I do, I am concerned that we might be faced with some coastal resilience options that might make it hard to safely allow public access. That's something we might have to consider in the future. I don't know what all the options are that we're going to have to consider. Um, from a, an erosion piece, if you're thinking about, you know, let's say what's happening out at Madigan Beach, you know, that's a, yes, we shouldn't, we can't do public access right now because it's not safe. Um, I would prefer we were encouraging other forms of public access so that we don't increase erosion at particular spots like that. I think that's maybe the conservation piece you're thinking of, Mary, that it's not always good for resiliency to have access across some pieces that are, you know, say eroding away or you know, access across salt marshes or some living shoreline options that we might put in. You can't always um, have people using it if you're going to provide the resiliency. If we're thinking structures that are going in, you know, like people enhancing bulkheads that they already have, you know, or, you know, what's happened out at it with SBPF with allowing, you know, trying to allow public access across the top or that being something that was asked for. I think I don't necessarily see the harm in saying that if you are putting something in, there should be public access, access across it, encouraging that. Um, I think it's outside our purview what that public access is going to look like. And I know there have often been conversations, you know, at the CONCOM where it's if you're putting a boardwalk across the salt marsh, it has to be so high with 
such high railings that change that view shed and what things look like um, across the landscape. And that's one of the things CONCOM has to look at is that um, the natural view shed. I think that if we're mandating public access across structures, we're also going to have to accept what that looks like, you know, from a safety perspective. So there might be some things there that Nantucket might not like what they look like. I don't, you know, no, it, from our perspective, it's more just the where if we are encouraging the consideration, at least of public access, I would hate to say that we're encouraging public access has to exist, because like I said, I don't think you always can maintain it safely. I don't know. That's just kind of what I was pondering about it. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Ian? So, um, so Jen, I, I guess I haven't phrased what my thinking behind this uh, as specifically as I should have done, because I'm I'm not referring to like Matica as a good example from your concern of clambering down the bluff. So I, I'm not referring to access to the beaches at all. Uh, what I, I am referring to and what uh, the North Shore has several examples is when you're already on the beach and you have the constitutional right to walk between the high and low tide line and it's blocked by structures. And so I'm saying that this is should be part of our purview to make it clear to the town administration that we would like to see this situation ameliorated where possible, where lawfully possible, because it's illegal to block public access between the high and low tide line without um, a, corollary, a correlation of uh, an implicit public good. And clearly, a, pi a private bulkhead sticking out is not an implicit public good. It's it's not involved with navigation. It's not involved with any of the you know original colonial ordinances that brought this about. So I know I'm sorry. I'm being long-winded. <laughs> all all I'm talking about is access on the beach. Once you're down on the beach, you know. Thank you, thank you, Mary. Right. So we had several hands up. So we'll go to Gary and then Joe and then Rachel. Well, what, what Jen was saying um, really reflects something I was going to say, which is there will be instances, and perhaps this is one of them, where, where the efforts that we feel are important for coastal resiliency will fly in the face of existing other either rules or regulations or, uh, or standards that we've used to. And at some point, uh, we might have to know, know what Ian said is we can accommodate where available. Now, it may, there may be instances where accommodation is not possible. We should always try to achieve both goals, coastal resilience, and also protect whatever the particular rules uh, are that we are, uh, we are worried about losing. But there may be instances in which there is no accommodation and then we have to take a position. We might have to take a position. You know, we're, we're talking about coastal resilience. And if we say, well, we can't do this. And if the reason that we cannot do this because of an existing standard, whether it's beach access or something else, means that the coastal resilience issues will be a lot worse for the community, then we're not making the right decision. So. As, as Ian said, we, where we can accommodate both, that would be great. But I think in the future, as we go forward, there may not always be that opportunity. And it may be that coastal resiliency issues are more paramount to the, to the safety and for the future of the island. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Joe? Uh, thank you, Baron. Yeah, I mean, uh, so last time I was riding on the beach in February, it was low tide and I was with a group and I started to look at, you know, the rock revetment. And then I believe the other one was the gun property. And I was trying to figure out like, okay, if it wasn't, you know, low tide, how would I get around? And so basically you would have to scale 30 feet up and go back down. Um, but I do think it would be nice in some other areas or some other locations that, public access is granted. Um, we've had, when I was on the CONCOM, we had someone out in Squam who wanted to uh, rebuild their their uh, revetment and, and asked for this extension. And we said, well, we'll give you the extension if we can get public access. And they withdrew the, the extension and then didn't allow public access. And 
and, and looking back, I felt like we should have pushed and said, no matter what, if you're going to get this, we got to, you know, you got to give us public access. Um, and I agree with Jen, there is some areas where you probably can't, you know, put a buffer or guardrail to protect the public. But I think in some other places you can, and there will be some areas that you want to be able to do this. But um, I felt that when, when I was on the CONCOM, we could only ask for that public access when the applicant came in. But I would love it if we, like Matt said, send them a letter and say, we've, you've got to figure out some way to grant public access across the front of your property, whether it's three feet, four feet, whatever that is. But I think it's something that's very important in Nantucket, not only for, you know, fish and fowl, et cetera, but, you know, during COVID, I, I also was riding down the beach and I came across anywhere from 50 to 75 people uh, in the middle of COVID, dead of winter, walking. And I think it's really important for our mental health to get out, go outside and be able to walk down the beaches. You know, everyone's in winter coats and it's, you know, nasty gray day, um, lovely February weather. But it was really nice to see only two faces I knew from Nantucket and everyone else was visiting or, you know, hold out on Nantucket during COVID. So I think it's really important to our uh, as you say, economy and for our well-being, that we find some way to get that access. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Rachel, you also had a comment, and there were some more hands up after that. We'll get to. Um, thank you, Mary. Uh, we deal with this a lot because we do actually still build docks for public use, so we are exempt from the private um, dock moratorium. When we go through uh, chapter 91, the land bank goes through a rigorous process where, and, and this is somewhat, it's, it's kind of ironic, but we go through a rigorous process where we have to show that our structure is not impeding public access across the marsh in that high to low water zone. Um, and actually one of our recent chapter 91 existing licenses at 50, 48 and 50 Tennessee, where we rebuilt a dock within the chapter 91 license. It said that if we were going to rebuild that dock, we would have to raise it to a height of five feet because we needed to allow for public passage beneath the dock. Um, we negotiated with chapter 91 pretty extensively to request a minor modification because our property is public. So you can actually, the difference for our property is that you can actually walk up to the you know, uplands across the upland and then back down if you want to and to avoid the structure. Um, but we had extensive discussions whether or not they wanted stairs going over the structure. Uh, the dock we just put in at Long Pond, you'll notice we took a lot of advantage of the topography so that there actually is a five foot clearance under it. Um, these are the rules. And every private homeowner that has these structures should be adhering to these rules. There should be public access and it should be required. As far as I'm concerned, every dock to the left and right of us is out of DEP compliance. Um, and how that gets enforced on Nantucket, I'm not sure, but um, I, it is an active consideration in the permitting process and flat out, everyone is out of compliance if there's no public access. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Vince, you had a comment, I think, and then Matt. Uh, thanks, Mary. So um, I can't help myself and I keep having to go back to the CRP, one of my favorite documents ever. Um, one of the um, projects in the CRP is Community Outreach and Property Owner Resilience Best Practice. Now, I read some of the description for this and what this could allow CRAC to do um, is not necessarily rewrite the law, but write a set of guidelines. Guidelines are not enforceable, but it would be best practice of sorts. Crack could quite literally develop the guidelines for what to do in these instances. Um, as I know that there's, just like Rachel said, there are rules on this that must be followed, but this could be something of a bridge that Crack could help um, at least give a, a direction on for, say, these out of compliance, or potentially out of compliance properties. Thank you, Vincent and Matt. Yeah, my point is there's, there's no property. Let's pretend that there's a property that's, you know, sort of even at low tide is now uh, the bulkhead is in the water. You could still do the same thing uh, that Rachel's talking about. The property owner could give passage along their property line with a five foot 
you know, a five foot path and along the back of their property and back down along the other side to allow the property to prop people to walk around their property. You know, there's, there, there's a way to deal with this. There's no property that's, you know, maybe there's not, maybe there is one, but there's very few properties that are completely landlocked and you can't at least walk, you know, walk on their lawn or walk around their property line. There's some way to do it everywhere. And I think that that's sort of should be our intent. And, uh, you know, and I agree, okay, maybe there's some situations where we can't, you know, don't, don't want to encourage people in front or where something's been there a long time and, you know, and it's sticking into the water, but the pat, you know, the public should be able to still navigate and, and get around, you know, get around that and continue down the beach. And I think that's sort of, that, that would be in the, you know, sort of in the advisory rules that, you know, that Vince is talking about. Thank you, Matt. Other comments? Jen? Thanks, Mary. This is a really interesting discussion because as I think about us being a coastal resiliency committee and what we're really talking about is essentially bulkheads that are on the North shore that are impeding passage across the beach. And if we're thinking coastal resiliency, structures or solutions, those are most likely things we're not going to be proposing or encouraging from a resiliency perspective in the future. So if we're thinking about what we can comment on for guidelines going forward, because that's really where we are, a lot of these things that are on the North Shore are grandfathered in and, you know, they might be coming for adaptations and it's certainly within the CONCOM's, you know, purview to ask for, for public access across them. Um, I, I, I would have a hard time saying that we would be supporting them as coastal resilience structures, uh, considering how they would impact the you know, surrounding community areas. I think we could think about guidelines for what's coming, what we're going to end up proposing or making or putting in in new places around the island. And that would, that we would encourage, you know, public access to be a component of anything that we saw as a solution for downtown or Madiket or within our, we have, you know, recommendations for homeowners as far as, you know, making their properties more resilient their you know recommendations for private property owners that if you are considering putting in a, a living shoreline or you know adapting your property to be more resilient and you're on the shoreline that you would think about how you could provide you know public access along the beach i think we could think about it that way i i guess i have a little bit of a hard time tying that into current structures that already exist on the north shore that we might not even actually have um I guess, uh, put forward as a recommendation for dealing with resiliency. I don't know. <laughs> thank you, Jen. Ian? Uh, thank you, Mary. So Jen, absolutely. I'm, I'm not saying that we should be supporting them. I feel we should be saying to the town, you know, do your damnedest to remove them. You know, I mean, really, and unless there is an overwhelming public benefit which then goes into the chapter 91 license of allowing it. And as Rachel was saying, so many of these are out of compliance now. And uh, that's one of the arguments that um, we're having between the owners of uh, 18 Washington Pond Road and uh, members of the Conservation Commission. And um, one of the one of the sticking points is that the riprap on the eastern shore of the bulkhead is sort of on where the property was subdivided. The applicants are saying they have no control over um, putting access over the riprap because the riprap is mostly owned by the, uh, the owner to the east of the bulkhead, to which uh, I, I and Mark Beale, amongst other members, said, so remove the riprap on your part and you know give public access above the high tide line so it's coming up on thursday i don't know how it's going to be ruled on but so i'm you know my my point is absolutely that you know in this situation um you know i'd love the time actually trying to buy some of these properties to remove the bulkheads and and what is ironic about 18 washing pond road is that when the bulkhead was originally a uh, wooden bulkhead was put in in the 70s. Uh, there was a pre, obviously pre-78 house entitled to statutory protection. Um, by the time they put a steel bulkhead in, 
the, um, the pre-78 cottage had been removed in its entirety and a new structure had been built that got a certificate of occupancy in 1996. And the applicants are arguing at the moment that the bulkhead is entitled to chapter 91 protection. And we're arguing, well, some of us on the committee are arguing, no, it isn't. The bulkhead was there to protect a house that is no longer there. So it is no longer entitled to statutory protection. So, um, <clears throat> and we've asked town council for an opinion on that. So. So, More than you wanted to know, probably, but you know, but I, I feel so I feel, and this is going to come up more and more clearly. And so I think it would be really helpful for a committee like the Coastal Resiliency to integrate this into part of our approach. And, and so part of what I'm concerned about, and, and I think, Ian, by the time I get to the end of this, you'll agree with me, but you might not at the beginning. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would be cautious about reacting to a, one situation or one or two situations and uh, recommending a policy, which then could be misinterpreted in a different situation, which wasn't considered. So I would be in favor of something that is a general statement. And, and this is, Ian, where I think you might agree with me, um, you know, that uh, does serve the needs of coastal resilience, that does take existing laws into account, that does take existing customs into account. But I would just be cautious about creating that statement um, in a way that was too tailored to an individual circumstance. Um, I'm also gonna note here that, that Vince and I reached out to the Harbor Master Sheila Lucy, and um, she will be attending our meeting on August 9th. Um, in addition to the uh, topic about the use of, of uh, the boat basins uh, and marinas in the harbor. We also plan to ask her um, from a public safety perspective, you know, does she, what does she see coming in the future for Nantucket's beaches? Um, and I think it would be very interesting to hear her perspective in the context of this discussion as well. Sarah? It would be churlish of me to disagree with you. <laughs> I just proposed you as chair. But no, I, I totally take your point, Mary and Jennifer. So. Thank you. And uh, Sarah, go ahead. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, I just um, want to reiterate what you said or back up what you said. I think that, um, you know, to Jen's point of discussing all the different aspects and potential public access. I think that what we're seeing over and over again is, is that it's a unique situation depending on the project, depending on the existing conditions, depending on what, you know, we can't anticipate all the different types of resiliency projects that are coming forward. We have in mind some things, but, you know, new frontier. So I think that, um, I think that's something general, like what you're saying, Mary, it's, it can be useful. I think, you know, ensuring that within any close to residency project that there's um, public access is considered or maintained as appropriate, you know, something sort of gen generalized, but emphasizing that we are um, in support of it. I think obviously what Vince said with the close to residency plan, we have that language in there. So what Rachel was saying that there's, there's already something when you go to, um, you know, there's already things in place when you propose new um, ventures or when you propose new structures. So I think kind of leaning on I, just backing up what Mary said, leaning on what's already there and, and us just kind of further supporting that is, is important. Um, we wouldn't want to minimize public access in any way. Um, I'm, very, I'm certainly against that, but obviously there's areas that with erosion, with, you know, protection of projects, maybe even in a short term, we might have a, if we're doing like a um, nature-based solution where we need a period of time for plant establishment or something like that where you can't you have to limit public access for a time i think that's also important to make sure the language um like allows for that as well thank you sarah further comments right. are committee members generally in favor of continuing this discussion with additional perspectives um, and additional thoughts uh, you know, I think it is a valuable discussion and, and something may come from it. Uh, I don't see an opportunity today to create something, but I wanna make sure that I'm reading the commission correctly. I did see a couple of nods. 
Well, go ahead, Ian. So, having taken all this into account, I, I do feel that um, when Joe was saying about how you know how he found it, I think Joe, didn't you give an example when there was a girl on a, a woman on a bicycle who ended up you know having to clamber over the rock revetment to continue her um, bike ride? And so I do think we should be, we should do our best within our language to add weight to protecting public access um, where it is both the law and feasible. I mean, I certainly, you know, I, I take Sarah's point that you don't want people scrambling up and down projects where you're trying to reestablish dune grass, but generally that's not between the high and low tide line, which is what I was really initially referring to um, when I brought this up. So, thank you. Thank you. Gary, did you have another comment? No, I just want to agree with uh, what Ian was saying. Uh, and yes, a woman did have to scale it. And, and uh, but if you look at those when you start to come up, they're, they're not an easy way to go. And, you know, if you're a bike or you're running or walking, whatever, you know, it, it's not a very safe, um, you're scaling it. You're basically mountain climbing or becoming a billy goat for a little bit, uh, trying to just get over the wall. And, you know, I could see someone walking, you know, uh, and then the next thing you know, they're turning around after an hour walk or something and tides come in and now they're after, you know, take off their shoes, whatever, climb around. And, and there's a lot of rocks and rubble down at the bottom. So it's even that's a little sketchy. It's not sand uh, conditions. So I, I think it's anything over five foot is where we really have an issue um, trying to get, you know, public access over some of these uh, rock revetments or retaining walls or, or bulkheads. So that's really going to be kind of a the issue we're going to be facing. And I'm sorry, Gary, did you also have a comment? No, no I did not, no. Okay. Um, so the, what, what, what makes this important for me is that um, I think it would be easy to say that public access is not a coastal resilience concern. You know, it, it, public access you know, can degrade the environment, but I think that is the, the short-sighted view of it. Um, I, I think that our mandate is to find ways to um, increase resilience without, um, or I should say, um, with consideration for the other elements of life on Nantucket. Um, you know, it's, it's not, you know, as I think I've said before, we're not just going to build a wall around the entire island. Um, you know, that, that could be highly protective, but uh, wouldn't necessarily be resilient in terms of um, being able to live on Nantucket. When I think about resilience, I, I think that the ultimate definition is being able to live on Nantucket um, with all the conditions that exist. It's not about protection um, as a 100% goal. It's not about retreat as a 100% goal. Um, it's about finding the right balance so that we live on Nantucket. Um, so that's where I'm coming down on it. And I think that's, it's a very difficult question to, um, to answer. Um, and I think it deserves a lot more discussion and, and some thought about, well, you know, if we said this, how could that be interpreted? How could that be used in a public setting? So I'm definitely in favor of more, more discussion and, and um, you know, finding ways that, that we can come to a, um, a meaningful recommendation. Jen? Thank you, Mary. I agree completely with what you said and, and backing up what um, you know, Sarah had kind of said as well. It's, we want to encourage public access to be part of you know, everything that goes into coastal, what we're doing with coastal resilience. That's part of what makes Nantucket unique. Um, I think it would be great to continue this conversation. Just think about what we're actually going to do as a committee, you know, where our voice is, whether it is a recommendation to different boards or if it's a position on um, coastal resilience activities into the future. Um, I do hope and think that there should be a component of what Sarah was saying as far as the temporal aspect of it, that it needs to be balanced and considered that there might be times when access will have to stop because we're putting in a project, but the idea is to, you know, bring it back or that if, you know, we lose access in one place, then we are attempting to provide access somewhere else, that it's a balanced part of how we're responding to resiliency on the shoreline. But again, that important piece of 
being on Nantucket, but I'd like to think about how we can be most effective if we're putting something together as a committee. Thank you, Jen. Vince. Uh, simple question. I don't have an answer to this. Should we seek? Should the committee seek access? Um, sorry, I beg your pardon. I'll start again. Should the committee seek input from Roads and Rights of Way Committee? Uh, that's certainly a potential avenue. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that they have beach access as a mandate, but I could be wrong on that. Ian. Well, um, so I have a copy of a letter that um, I actually forwarded to Matt that was sent by Roads and Right of Way last January to the select board, asking them to back Dylan Fernandez's um, bill, adding recreation to uh, the public trust doctrine. And so I, I would say that absolutely um, reaching out to Roads and Right of Way would be a very good idea. Thank you, Ian. You would probably and be wise to suggesting it. <laughs> wise to invite their perspective, certainly. Yeah. Further comments on this topic, Matt. I would say the select board is aware of this. One of the criteria out at Sconset is a walkable beach, and you know, in order to, and, and some people think that is not possible. Other people think it is. Who knows? You know, time will tell. But that is, you know, that is one of the criteria of failure is if there's not a walkable beach in front of that structure, that's, you know, it's failed. And so I think that that is, so, you know, so the, the select board is trying to say, you know, some of these things are possible, you know, some of these things are existing and we've lost it, you know, sort of like washing pond. It's, it's you know, and, and we just, so, you know, it's either you, you find a way around or put enough sand that people can walk in front of it. You know, I look at it and say it's one or the other. You know, either give us, give the public access around your property or over, you know, safely over the structure or find a way around it. I, I don't think it's that difficult myself. I, th I think this is a, one of the sort of one of the uh, sort of just a basic uh, Nantucket requirement is how I look at it. This is a basic public uh, right here that we should be trying to. Uh, you know, continue. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Joanna and then Gary. Hi there. So just as a point of clarity, um, I know I was a little bit late, but are we trying to address one specific issue on Washington Pond or are we trying to create a set of rules that could be applicable to everybody? <laughs> <laughs> May I, Mary? Yes, please, Ian. So, so hi, Joanna. So, um, <laughs> so I, I originally approached uh, Vince with the idea that we write a letter specifically about 18 Washington Pond Road, which has now morphed, I think, into this discussion on policy going forward. Okay, okay. So, it, but let me ask another follow-up question. So the reason you wanted to write specifically to 18 Washington Pond Road was about that stone wall he's got on the beach there. Right. Well, so it it if you go on Google Maps, you'll see that it's yeah. uh, it's a fairly massive uh, steel no, bulkhead. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So uh, we uh, so I I wanted to have support for uh, the general position was that they should provide public access to get over it as as part of their application to rebuild the groin on the east side. Originally, when it was permitted, uh, it had three groins on east, west, and uh, center. Then they dispensed with the one in the middle. The one in the west is still there, but the one in the east was destroyed in a storm last year, and that's what they want to rebuild. Okay. And so then access came up. Okay. Okay. Now I understand the context okay. of that. Um, so, uh, you know, listening to this is really interesting because uh, I'm thinking about two parts, right? One part, which may be a specific opinion about this situation, but I liked Vince's idea about maybe having there be like a little set of guidelines that we could recommend as part of how you evaluate uh, either improvements to a property you own on the beach or someone who comes before a committee, 
right? Similar to kind of I, uh, I, what I think I have talked about a couple times is like a checklist for CONCOM, for um, Capcom, right? So maybe a little checklist that would say, here are the things that are you should consider as part of a coastal resiliency lens when you are approaching issues like access to beach, right? Because I, I, I mean, Ian, I'm assuming because you sit on ComCom, have they come before the committee already and has this been suggested and they didn't want to do it or, or what happened? Uh, so, the, so they were, so I, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so the, the answer was they, can, they conceded that there should be some public access and so they put steps in, in the latest plan, they have steps on the Western end, which allow you to get up onto the, uh, onto the uh, sand filled bulkhead. But on the Eastern end, basically the only stairs that they have uh, considered putting in uh, are basically means that you have to, anything but low tide, you have to wade through the water to get up and over onto the bulkhead. Mm -hmm. And so some of us on the commission feel that um, that's not uh, that's not satisfactory. And uh, but they're not trying to block access like some of the other folks we've had in the past. Uh, they're well, that's I, I would say, no, they aren't. I don't want to misrepresent it. But when they came in to uh, apply for rebuilding the bulkhead, uh, rebuilding the groin, uh, mm -hmm. they had no designs for stairs. So it was only when we dug in and said, you know, come back with a design for public access that they uh, put, um, this is now I think the third iteration of stair design. Right. So, yeah. I mean, so, cause kind of going off of what Vince is suggesting about these guidelines and the things that you, the rest of you have said, I mean, it seems like we could make like four or five bullet points that would be recommendations that we suggest when, in, when you are running into these sorts of scenarios, right? Like, um, you know, projects in the dunes, you, you wouldn't want to disturb for that. De fixing bulkheads on private beaches, you want to allow for pedestrian access so that, so that we're being proactive as opposed to reactive, because right now we're reacting to a situation. Um, although it sounds like you've gotten them to mitigate Yes, I think, well, as, as Rachel said, um, you know, one of the arguments has been that they are, out, that they are not in compliance with their right. Chapter 91 right. license. Right. And their argument has been that the Chapter 91 license only applies to the actual steel bulkhead itself. And it's so, and you know, their attorney, if Dan Drake, I think is this, Dan, Dan Bailey, if Dan Bailey was here, I'm sure he would disagree with my uh, my summing it up, you know, but that's the way I've sort of taken it. And, and Joanne, I would echo Ian's comments. Uh, a, a lot of people get so far and really don't want to guarantee us any of this access, but I think that it's something we need to push forward and really ask that this is necessary now, as, as you know, Vince said earlier, coastline's starting to creep up. So this is going to become more and more prevalent around Nantucket. Um, so I think right. that's something no, we need to I agree. put together. I, 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 yes, I, I agree. And I think that we should have some sort of statement about public access and, and mitigation to allow for it. And I think, you know, to be proactive about that is a, a good idea. Agreed. But also to allow for the things that Sarah and Jen talked about, right? Like things that, you know, there may be projects where we can't, where that can't be met, right? Right. And, and again, that, that's my concern that if we issue a statement that it becomes a blanket statement that then impacts other projects in a negative way um, that we didn't anticipate or don't support. Um, Gary, I think you had a comment too. I did. I, I guess, you know, Matt mentioned the situation at Sconset and, um, and earlier we talked about a possible conflict. So I'm thinking one of the things I haven't seen talked about very much, I, I don't, by the way, I personally don't have a position on the Baxter Road issue, but, you know, basically those geotubes have cut off public access to the beach. And the next thing they're trying to do is expand them. And interestingly, I haven't seen that as part of the debate 
that, oh, you can't expand that because that'll take more beach access away from the public. So here's an instance where I think basically in view of the, uh, the problematic erosion of this constant bluff, you know, the community at the time was willing to put in these great big geotubes and, and that's the end of beach access to the public for that part of the island. And no one questions that anymore because uh, at least the folks there think that it is protecting the bluff. So, so sometimes those decisions occur and coastal resiliency needs to take priority. But in most cases, hopefully, uh, that isn't the case and we can protect the public's access through accommodation. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Joe and then Vince. I actually want to say, Gary, it's, it's easier to climb over the geotubes than it is some of these rock revetments sure. or the steel bulkheads. I hate to say that, but it's really true. I mean, I, I've, you know, my mountain bike has been able to get me a lot of places or my fat bike. Um, so that was just one area. Not that I really, uh, probably could, I probably could have walked in front of the geotubes, but I was afraid of getting my, not afraid, but didn't want to get my feet wet. So I climbed up and over and it was very easy to traverse. Um, I will say that 18 and what's it? Uh, I think 13 East Tristans and 25 East Tristans, though, those are more challenging. And, um, you know, I'd hate to be someone older in my age or even actually my knee and back injury, um, I'd be a little more cautious trying to climb up on over those uh, areas. But yeah, um, sorry to publicly state that, but it's kind of a fact. So sorry. Thank you, Vince. Um, I'm not trying to raise anyone's ire. And the situation in front of the geotubes is constantly changing, but it's also quite constantly assessed. Um, and last Thursday, uh, at least the last day that I was there, it was still passable and walkable in front of the geotubes. Uh, not the case 100% of the time. I don't, uh, I, I wouldn't want to overstate anything, but um, currently they're um, meeting the, the, the requirements for being passable. Thank you, Vince. Okay, so um, th this is not the only interesting discussion we have on the schedule for today. <laughs> so, um, with everyone's permission, can we move on to the next agenda item? All right, thank you. Um, but this will definitely be a continuing discussion. Uh, so we have a second quarter report um, to deliver to the select board. Vince has prepared a draft. Um, I, did we see this once before, Vince? I've forgotten. No, uh, we didn't get to discuss no. it. Okay. It was posted for the last meeting that uh, where we didn't have quorum. But it's been sent out twice. Everyone's got it. Um, and hopefully everyone's had a chance to review it. There's been no change in it since it was sent um, for the July 12th meeting that didn't happen, it's the same. Okay, uh, so as, as I said, hopefully everyone has had a chance to look at this. Uh, we did a report for the first quarter. Um, this is in a similar vein, um, but based on activities in um, April, May, and June. Uh, any comments on the content of the report? Things to remove, things to put in, things to wordsmith. Gary? The only comment I have is I couldn't figure out what the um, NRD was because I didn't see the definition. And then, then later on, I figured out it's the Natural Resources Department, but maybe it ought to be defined somewhere. Well, we will check on that. Thank you, Gary. I know that the government loves acronyms, so you, you're right. It is sometimes helpful to define them. Yeah. Uh, any other comments or questions, Vince? Um, yeah, I'm just going to make a note for myself here for the NRD and I'll fix that. Thank you, Gary. Okay. There was one bullet point in the requests and recommendations. Um, yeah, those two are effectively the same as previous. This is new. Right. And I only but that's include... our discussion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have a position on this, but um, this is kind of the one that I was slightly unsure of. I just put it in because it was discussed on June. 28th. Yeah. So, um, so as, as Vince said, he added this to um, the list of potential requests and recommendations. Uh, this was briefly discussed. Does this, is this appropriate to include in this form on this report? 
do committee members want to change what it says? Do committee members want to remove it? Um, this is a proposed item. This is not something that committee members requested. Sarah? I just have a question about the first bullet point. So I think it's good to get more feedback from the select board as to how the how crack can be of use, you know, as an advisory committee to the select board. So what I I guess my my sticking point is on the word address. Um, so you know, a lot of the work that we've done has been talking about issues and like talking about them. Um, and I really like the second bullet of you know kind of wanting to be able to work on some of the recommendations. And so I guess I'd like more clarification um, or provide more clarification to the select board by what we mean by address. So um, do we want to have like discussions that we then like bring forth recommendations to the select board? Do we want to address uh, specific issues where we could make an action plan or are we, simply a discussion group. I guess I, I would hope that we would be able to take more action, but I don't want us also to be the scape, not scapegoat, but the, for the select board just to put, put things to us that they aren't dealing with or that they aren't, you know, like, oh, well, we'll put it to the select board or to the crack, but like, what's, what's, what are we doing? For lack of a better way to ask it. So, uh, my, um, take on this was that we were formed as an advisory committee to the select board. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if there is any specific issue on which the select board wants our advice, um, that's the purpose of this question. Uh, it certainly could be different. I think even, sorry, uh, if I may respond, Mary. Yes, please. Um, yeah, exactly what you just said could even be the phrasing of it. Like if there is anything that the select board would like the advice and um, you know, because the because uh, the Coastal Residency Advisory Committee uh, is, you know, set to advise the select board for issues, I think maybe even just saying that, um, I can't remember the words you just used, Mary, but however you just said it, like, you know. So it would, it would read, yeah. are there current or upcoming issues uh, for which the select board would like the crack committee's advice? Yeah, I think that's, that's good because Maybe it's just nitpicking for me, but um, I think sometimes in the past years we've had um, the the question of how do we address issues has been a little bit muddied. I'm just saying this for new members too, by what is our action? Are we like just, you know, so it's good to clarify that. Okay. Any other comments on that point? You could say advice or recommendations perhaps advice and or recommendations. Okay. Getting back to the last bullet point, is this something the committee wants to include in the report to the select board? So this is a specific recommendation that the committee would be making to the select board. I wanna make sure we have that discussion that that is a recommendation we want to make. Jen? I, guess, I, I don't have a problem recommending it. Do we know the extent of it? What, what, what are we hoping, what is crack hoping comes out of it? You know, what, what actions would we like to see happen there? Okay, so Vince did refer to shoreline stabilization as recommended in the design thinking workshop, just do it project list. Is that something you can put on the screen, Vince? Um, I don't have a link for it. I can go find it and find, uh, put it up in a second. Um, yeah. And that was just, it's almost a copy and paste from that list. There was no design, there was no concept. There was just uh, one of the recommendations from the CRP that might be implemented in a slimmed down version was the idea. I'll find it. Okay. Uh, so if, if there's no design, then we're telling the select board to undertake a project for which there is no definition. So that's a little concerning. Uh, Jen, you had a comment. I did. Thank you, Mary. Um, you know, I know this is, is partly on there because it was on the design thinking workshop, but we've also had advocates from 
Maniket come forward and speak um, most recently. And I guess I have, I think if we're doing a recommendation to the select board, I'd like it to be a lot more targeted than just shoreline stabilization as in the CRP. I think the bullet point above is very important because it's pushing all of the 40 recommendations to be considered as a goal that needs to happen. I think that if we're going to pull out a very specific goal that we want to advocate for, I'd like us to have a little more information on what we're specifically advocating for, because there are a lot of areas on Nantucket that we should be advocating the select board to just do it on. There are a lot of areas that are at you know, high risk. And, you know, I think about, you know, the Brant Point area, the Madigan, of course, there's areas in the harbor that it, there's just a lot of places that we would like to see action happen. Um, and I don't want us to necessarily make what seems like potentially a biased recommendation just because we've had, you know, one group come and be very vocal. I'd like us to maybe do a considered look at if we're, say we're recommending that the crack takes the uh, 40 recommendations in the CRP and makes that something they want to do in the next 10 years, do we want to do a prioritization of that in some scale? And maybe that's a more targeted recommendation that we're making. Um, that's just my thought on that. Thank you, Jen. Sarah? Yeah, thank you, Mary. I would support that as well, what Jen was saying. Um, we, I fully support the idea of encouraging work to be done in Madigan. Um, but I do agree that um, similar to what we were saying before, we don't want to change our methods um, just for one thing. We want to um, you know, make sure that we're all on the same page. We haven't voted on this and we haven't voted on the language. And I think that's that's important when we're officially making a recommendation to the to the select board. So just being more clarifying with um, this recommendation would be would be helpful. Thank you, Sarah. Matt? Yeah, this this came out of the design thinking workshop. It was one of three items that that was thought by the group would be able to be uh, done a little more quickly than a lot of the others. And so, you know, so I, I don't have an issue with I don't think it's being taken out of uh, out of turn or I don't think it's skipping over other people. I think this was I, I think the idea of it was that there were three different items in different parts of the island, you know, sort of uh, the one on Sacacha was kind of a problem that needed to be dealt with anyway. So I think the idea was, okay, let's do a few samples of what can happen. Uh, I worry, I think we need to be a little more specific on this recommendation, uh, you know, because we say, well, it doesn't have to be everything, but you could build and add it over time. I think if we could be a little more specific as to what that might be, because I think if it goes to select board, it'll, what could happen is it could the staff could say, well, we need to have a plan. And if we don't have a plan, that will take two years. And then it has to be funded and it could drag on forever. If there's a way to the Vince or you know, staff can say, OK, what can we do short term that starts toward this? And then, you know, if there are steps that need to be longer term, put those into place, you know, over the next year or so, you know, I think that would be that would ensure that this doesn't get stuck. You know, that would ensure that this recommendation doesn't get sort of, oh, well, we have to wait till we get a funding from town or some other reason. Oh, we need to really study this some more. You know, if we could get, may put a little more meat on the bone, this may move a little quicker. Thank you, Matt. Um, so one of the things that I'm, when I'm reading this, I wonder if we took the word undertake and substituted something else. So some of the suggestions I've heard would be you know, that the town prioritize shoreline stabilization or that the town develop a plan for shoreline stabilization. You know, is, is undertake the word that is problematic in this? Um, and, and of course the other option would be to remove it from this report, but to make it a focus of our third quarter discussion so that we could come back in our third quarter report with a more specific recommendation uh, on this topic. Part of my concern is if we send this as is, um, that we don't pay any more attention to it having made a recommendation, or that we come back on the next report and say, well, never mind the recommendation we made in the previous report. Now we're making this recommendation for this project. Sarah? Thanks, Mary. I, I think undertake, I don't have, the, isn't the problem for me. It's kind of like the next sentence where it's like, this doesn't have to be a full project. I sort of know what you mean. 
where like it like more immediate action needs to be taken um rather than and correct me if i'm wrong rather than sometimes the timeline of designing a full project getting a you know outside consultants and it's a multi-year project when there's it's more of an emergency response if i'm if i'm kind of reading this correctly like something needs to be done and we support this like board moving forward with doing something that then can be built on that's how i get how i'm interpreting this um and i agree that something needs to be done right away so i'm not the undertake part isn't doesn't bother me it's the the second part where it's a little um less direct or you know and so i don't know what that exact language should be um but i think that's that's where i'm hesitant because it needs to be a little more prescriptive maybe um and so maybe it does need more discussion jen Thank you, Mary. Following up on what Sarah just said, I think what would make me more comfortable about doing a recommendation that's targeted towards Madikit is if we do have a, perhaps a really, you know, kind of targeted discussion at our next meeting that pulls up the recommendation from the design thinking workshop, pulls up what's in the CRP, and we look at it together and discuss what can we really recommend as next steps because we're in a, we are an advisory committee to the select board. And I think if we just keep coming forward with these short recommendations, you know, do something about Madikit. Okay, maybe we can give a little more guidance on that that say, okay, uh, these are the things recommended for Madikit. We think if A, B, and C happens in the next two years, that would be really beneficial. So we would like, you know, the select board to focus on, you know, these targeted pieces of what needs to happen at Madikit so that everything else that we've recommended in the CRP then can then fall in place later. You know, if it's just that we're really concerned about Chicago Street and the corner to the road and protecting protecting that intersection, uh, then yes, let's have something focused that we give to the town on what we should really, um, how we hope that they would proceed coming forward. And, uh, you know, Matt, I get what you're saying about wanting to move ahead and not doing more studies, but that place is so dynamic right now that I think there probably will be a time period of pulling in a consultant to design stabilization out there that would respond to how um, the erosion is kind of shifting out there. But I think if we give that guidance, that we'd have a lot more weight to a recommendation that we're making. Thank you, Jen. Other comments or questions on this? Rachel? I just wanted to add that, you know, as a new crack member, um, I really like what Jen just said. I was at the design thinking workshop. I think it would be great to revisit those recommendations. Um, and I do agree um, that, and I'm, I'm still kind of figuring out the role of the advisory committee, but I think the, the role is really to provide enough information so that then they can decide whether or not they want to take that and run with it. And if they do, then they have the capacity to do that. They don't have to go do additional research to figure out the, you know, to, to figure that out. So I like the idea of having, having a recommendation that is really fully fleshed out uh, to bring to the select board that they can then look at and make some decisions on. So I just I wanted to add that I really liked that idea of what Jen was saying. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Jen. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Sorry, just to say one more thing that I thought of. I think that if we do do this for Madikit, I think we need to make it very obvious that, you know, maybe this is the path that uh, we're using going forward, that we're going to do that with other areas around the island that we're starting here and that, that we would do a similar kind of analysis and recommendation for initial first steps for other areas of the island where it makes sense. So maybe that would be, you know, subsequent meetings afterwards. But um, it feels like it might be a productive way to kind of look at what we did with the CRP and make those targeted recommendations to the town. Uh, Ian? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Mary. So um, Rachel, I'm so pleased that you've joined CRAC and uh, Jennifer, come back to CONCOM, all is forgiven. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so one potential way that we could change this would be to make it less specific um, and say something, for instance, that 
a CRAC recommends to the select board that the uh, just do it project list from the design thinking workshop continue to um, that, that we continue to make progress on those recommendations. Um, so without specifying, you know, which projects and which pieces of which projects and, you know, where the money comes from and, and so on. Um, simply an endorsement of the recommendations that came out of the design thinking workshop. Is, is that appropriate here? Uh, and then we would continue to develop the specific recommendations for what to do. Thank you, Vince, for editing that on the screen. So it's, I guess the CRC recommends that, uh, that to the select board that the town continue to make progress on the just on the design thinking workshop, just do it progress uh, project list. I realize that might be sort of a watered down statement, but um, we have to remember the context is the second quarter discussions that we had as a committee. And I think it's appropriate to say that in that, in, say this in that context. Jen? Thanks, Mary. I don't have a problem with putting that in there. I'd just like us to see us move forward with what we were kind of uh, just discussing as some next steps for recommendations. Yeah, I, I can definitely make sure that now that I'm chair again for a year, I can make sure that's on the agenda. <laughs> Um, and, and I appreciate that feedback. I think it is um, something we should continue to uh, to do some work on and to see some action in that uh, area. Ian? So how about uh, the CRAC recommends to the select board that the time continue to make progress in the design thinking workshop, just do it project this and intends to make more specific recommendations going forward. Sure. All right, are we ready to uh, approve the report as a whole or are there more questions or comments on, on any aspect of it, uh, Vince? You already covered it. I was gonna ask about the rest of it. <laughs> Does anyone wanna make a motion to approve this report and send it to the select board? Gary? I'll so move. Thank you, do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Joe. Uh, any further discussion before we go to a vote? Seeing none, a roll call vote. Gary Beller? Aye. Sarah Boyce? Aye. Matt Fee? Still with us, Matt? All right, I'm not hearing from Matt. Rachel Freeman? Rachel, you're on mute. Matt, uh, yeah, I, I Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Rachel? Aye. Ian Golding? Aye. Jen Carberg? Aye. Joanna Roach? Aye. And Joe Topham? Aye. Mary Longacre, aye. Thank you all. Uh, so Vince will let me know when that gets on the select board agenda. He and I are usually there to present the report um, and answer any questions the select board may have. Uh, so you can watch their agendas and I'm sure Vince will let us know when that is scheduled. Thank you all for that. Um, next item on the agenda is the uh, quick update from Vince on the Massachusetts Coastal Flood Risk Model, which we did remember to spell out the acronym MCFRM <laughs> um, and the town GIS system, and then continuing that onto our sea level rise recommendation. Vince. Uh, thank you, Mary. So there's uh, a few different moving parts to this, most of which seem to be pretty set at the moment. So um, so uh, I think uh, all committee members got this in an email, so I'm literally 
reiterating myself uh, for the public record. Uh, good news, uh, the MCFRM is now a public document. It's available on the state website for the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, and you can go and download it and get it all for free. So that being said, it's not an easy document to use, but it is there and you can use uh, each map layer as a specific layer, not in combination, or at least I haven't figured out how to do that yet. It's not three layers anymore, it's four. So uh, that was something that was not previously available to us. So previously we had present 2050 and 2070. Now also available to us is 2030. Um, I have to also say out loud, uh, the state hasn't made a fanfare of advertising that this is out there, which is why it took me a few months to figure that out. Um, I had been dealing with the information I got two years ago. I'm sorry, two and a half years ago, practically at this point. So uh, it's all out there. So we have the right to use it. I've also confirmed that with um, my contact within the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. He said, we do have the right to put it on the town website. So that's all there. And we have an extra layer to use and everything. Uh, one thing to note is we do not yet have 2100. It's just not developed. Um, when they were initially talking about launching this, they're still, they, still, they thought they would have 2100 ready. It's still not done. Um, and this is more than um, a year after it was supposed to be launched and then it got deferred for a year. So I think it got made public in April or May. So that's how recent this is out on the state website. And we've had it for much longer than that. Um, then I also checked with Nathan Porter. Uh, he checked with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the company that does support for the uh, town's online GIS system. It is entirely possible to get it put on. He's trying to look at how that might work. Um, there seems to be some questions about um, uh, the way that it's presented. Um, I don't want to get into the weeds on this one, but it's presented as images, not editable data files. So when it comes to saying, redoing the colors to make it easier to understand or something, that might not be necessarily editable. The best we might be able to do is play with the transparency just so that we can see the building layers underneath it. It's not the most straightforward way of explaining it, but that's about as good as I could do for now. Um, then uh, there's just a small cost associated with it. Um, it's in the low thousands of dollars, but it's a one-time addition. And then that's that. Uh, Natural Resources Department, uh, I spoke to the director and it seems like we can bear that cost. So it's kind of a when, not if. So So the upside is that information is now publicly available. And that was the biggest uh, impediment to us being able to use it for a recommendation was that it wasn't available to the public to reference. Uh, so now it is, which is good news. And, and not only that, but their plans are to put it actually on the Nantucket GIS system to make it really available. Um, so with that change in the availability of the data, do we want to um, use that as a reference in our recommendation on sea level rise uh, to the select board? We had previously used the NOAA data and we had had discussions um, sort of leaning towards continuing to use the NOAA data and I'll note that there's no reason why we can't refer to both, um, but we were hesitant to use the MCRFRM because of the availability problem, which is gone. So further thoughts on that. Vince, if you wanna put up the um, recommendation that you have worked on, it's not in its final form. Um, this will take me a second to find yeah. it. So thoughts on um, continuing on the same path of using only NOAA, um, using both, or switching entirely to MCFRM. Um, the, the benefit to MCFRM, it's more detailed and it's more localized than the NOAA data. The NOAA data, the benefit is it's you know a national database um, created by the federal government. Uh, might have more um, universal appeal, I guess would be the way to say it. Um, Sarah? Yeah, thank you, Mary. Um, I'm just gonna say the same thing I keep saying is I definitely strongly believe we should not move away from NOAA. If anything, we should have a hybrid. Um, just like you were saying, Vince, the Massachusetts, it's, it's more detailed, it's less user-friendly, less easy to use and not updated regularly. And they say they're gonna update it and they don't. So. I think it's great data. I just think in terms of usability and pointing people to it, 
that we should definitely either like also be accepting Noah or point, pointing people to Noah. It's, you know, more um, regularly updated and the um, user interface and, and readability of it is, is much easier, I think, for a lot of people. So that's just my two cents for that. I do appreciate the work into making the state level data accessible, um, but I, I hesitate to rely solely on that when it's not updated as regularly. Thank you, Sarah. Other comments? A uh, simple question. I think this is the this is the last version I have where we removed <sighs> um, one or two things in a table along the way. Um, oh, yeah, we were talking about this one, this graph. Um, this was the last one that we had and had circulated. Um, so there's a lot of edits in this. So it's a lot of redlining. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll come up with some further edits with the new information that we have and bring this back for discussion to the committee. Um, and again, the point that was made, I think, at our last discussion is that we're not changing the, the recommendation at the heart at the beginning, but we're changing how we present the supporting information because that information has been updated um, since we made the original recommendation. Um, also noting that the Coastal Resilience Plan, um, that this original recommendation was supposed to be updated after the Coastal Resilience Plan came out. The Coastal Resilience Plan did use the MCFRM data and recommended it. So again, we want to address that, um, that situation. Okay, if, if there are no further comments, we'll just bring back a new draft uh, for discussion. And Vince, you and I can talk about that. Uh, yes, and absolutely. And um, obviously extremely happy to take any more feedback from committee members along the way. I know we've had it in open discussion, but if anyone reads it, see something they like, don't like, want to add, edit or fix, please send it to me. Great, thank you, Vince. Okay, if there's no further discussion there, we do have uh, the opportunity for public comment at this time about anything that either is or is not on the agenda for coastal resilience. Are there any members of the public, uh, please just go ahead and unmute yourself and identify yourself if you have a comment to offer. Okay. If there are none, um, the New Business Committee and Natural Resources Department reports. Uh, Vince, why don't you start off? Sure. Um, so last Saturday morning, uh, from 8.30 to 10.30, I had the pleasure of being invited to speak at the Brand Point Association um, annual breakfast. It was a wonderful event. There was three guest speakers after the committee business. Um, there was um, uh, Stephen Welch from the... Uh, it was Stephen Welch. Ray Paul. Ray Paul, yes, it was Ray Paul, um, came to speak on HDC and Historic District um, uh, and how that might affect the Brown Point area and um, gave a bit of a recap of the history and such. Um, I spoke on coast resilience specifically about the Brown Point area. And then Greg, what's Greg's second name, Gary? I, I totally blanked him a second. I don't have that either. <laughs> From um, Brown Point Big real point. estate. He gave an update on um, the real estate market in the area. Then the three of us uh, uh, did our presentations and then saved all questions for the end. And then three of us answered questions as a panel. Um, there was a great many questions on coastal resilience, on how it might work, how it might be implemented. Um, it was it was a very interesting thing to see how people very quickly, just like in the design thinking workshop and just like in the development of the coastal resilience plan, went quickly to the question of costs and how to get um, funding, outside funding and uh, various other structures in place quite quickly. It, that was one of the things that struck me. Um, the president, uh, the, the outgoing president of the Brent Point Association, Carol Beller, was who invited me. Um, and I had breakfast with uh, Gary and Car Carol. Gary was present as a member of that association, um, and he may be able to offer some other com comments on how it went. Uh, thanks, Vince. No, first of all, thank you for uh, appearing at the meeting. Uh, uh, it was a well attended meeting, and your presence and your presentation was very much appreciated. 
Um, and, you know, we had the three speakers, Vince and Ray Paul and Greg from Great Point, but um, most of the questions from our community came to Vince uh, because we are concerned and Grand Point is concerned and is obviously in the target zone, you know, when we think about the issues we're going to be dealing with with respect to coastal resilience. Um, and uh, I, I was interested that uh, several of the questions talked about specific amounts of funding that we needed, even details about when are these road raises going to occur? Uh, they're going to happen once, you know, and or in several several tranches. And one of the concerns that was expressed, uh, which maybe is something uh, our committee might want to comment on, is that um, the people in who asked the questions were, were really hopeful that the town would get a grant writers, because when we see we talked about the. we're gonna to have to reach out to FEMA and any other funding source in order to, uh, to realize the kind of funding that we need. And um, that calls for talented and um, uh, important grant writers. And what Vince, what um, you know, we have the, we have the certain point, we don't have them. And we really need that. And our community certainly is hopeful that um, the town can make that a higher precedent. Maybe, I don't know if our committee ought to be suggesting that as well, if not in this quarterly report, say in the next one, it is important uh, since every other community that is facing these coastal resilience issues is going to be dealing with the same funding requirements. And we, we see, the request coming in, whether it's from Florida, from Miami, or even from Boston. And we need to make sure that we get uh, the right people writing those grants for us so we can at least have some place in the line to, to get those requests in. So uh, it was a, I was very impressed with the amount of interest in our community on coastal resilience. Thanks again, Vince. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, Vince, for the presentation. Um, other reports from Planning Board, Conservation Commission, um, Select Board, Ian? Um, so in case anybody wasn't aware of the uh, recent appointments to the Conservation Commissioner, uh, the Maureen Phillips was not reappointed, Seth Engelborg was, and the two uh, new commissioners um, are Joe Plandowski and Mike Mizzarelli. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I wanted to note that the uh, magazine Ramblings, um, maybe you see that there, I'm not sure, um, did have an article, Coast Resilience in Practice, where they interviewed Holly Backus um, specifically about Resilient Nantucket and also about the Coast Resilience Plan. So thank you to NPT for that article. And it's available online uh, on their website. Sarah? Yeah, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to bring it up, but um, I had a question for the group about the harbor plan. So I know that um, the Natural Resource Department, you know, announced at the um, State of the Harbor the other day that they're undertaking the harbor plan and they have secured, you know, a consultant and I think it was with this whole group um, and obviously Vince can talk more to this. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about incorporating the coastal resiliency plan into the harbor plan. And I just thought it would be good to bring up at our meeting um, what our role is in that as a committee. Are we going to wait for the people who are writing the harbor plan to come to us with questions? Are we going to be involved? Are we going to send representatives? So I just had a, some questions about that and how we can support the harbor plan um, so that they are synchronous <laughs> and not random a bunch of random plans on the shelf. Uh, Vince, any comments on that? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so um, I suppose the easiest way I can uh, explain how it works 
Jeff is the primary, he's the lead on it, and he's working with Tara Riley, um, the, uh, the, our biologist and the hatchery manager. Um, and they're the ones that are primarily involved with it, along with Thais Fournier, the water quality per, um, specialist for the town. Um, I'm assisting only in terms of the Coast Resilience Plan. I am not a project lead on this one. Jeff is. Uh, Natural Resources Director Jeff Carlson is. So um, when I was asked for input and information, and I made the obvious points about bringing in the CRP and integrating that within in the plan. So uh, they're just um, in the initial phases of getting the project set up at the moment. I have no idea what the public involvement part is or the committee involvement part is, but how about I answer that at the next meeting on the 9th? I'll get answers for that. Thank you, Vince. Um, I'll also note that uh, NPNEDC saw a draft of the open space plan um, along with the survey results that came out. Um, and I was very happy to see that the Coast Resilience Plan was mentioned as, you know, the open space pen would need to be tied in with the Coast Resilience Plan. Uh, but again, that's something that perhaps we can find out, um, you know, if there's a, an opportunity for review and involvement um, for the Coast Resilience Advisory Committee in that. Any other uh, reports? Okay. I was selected to the planning board, so that's it. <laughs> for one year yeah. but i am going to run so thank thank you for joining us uh here on the coast resilience advisory committee too joe um so our next meeting is august 9th as i previously mentioned uh, we will have representatives from the nantucket yacht club great harbor yacht club nantucket boat basin and our harbor master sheila lucy and the idea is just to have a conversation with them um you know what are their concerns for coastal resilience what plans are they developing um, and to uh, just help them, uh, well, to, to help us understand how they're working uh, together with the town or um, what they, they hope they will be able to do with the town. Um, so just a, an initial conversation in that respect. Uh, and we've certainly had a plenty of discussion for topics at upcoming meetings, but uh, I'll reiterate, I'm always happy to take suggestions for those. Uh, is there any discussion, uh, Ian, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Mary. Did I jump the gun? I was nope. just wanted to add something as a as a commissioner, which um, is that I asked Vince to um, post uh, a Columbia Climate School uh, article on the Thwaites Glacier in Antarctica, which um, has been making the news recently, and it would appear to be um, so. It would appear to be well on its way to collapse and much earlier than expected. And um, it's an indication of how it's almost certain that our projections for sea level rise going forward are, uh, are conservative to say the least. So um, it, it makes for a grim reading. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. Vince? Uh, pressing send, Ian. <laughs> Thank you. So I was going to move on to the next meeting dates. Our regularly scheduled dates are the second and fourth Tuesday of the month for August. Uh, after the ninth would be the 23rd. Uh, as I noted at our last meeting in June, we do have five Tuesdays in August. So if there was, um, if we knew in advance that people were going to be on vacation on the 23rd, we would have the opportunity to move to the 16th or 30th. Um, but if nobody indicates um, a preference for that, we will continue to schedule for the 23rd. So just send Vince any notes about your availability, um, particularly because our last meeting did not have a quorum. Um, although that was not uh, necessarily an availability, that was also due to um, having the new seats added um, and getting those filled in time, um, which for many committees was an issue in the first couple of weeks of July. Um, and if there's nothing else, we will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Gary. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Thank you, Matt. Uh, roll call vote. Gary Beller. Aye. Gary Boyce. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Rachel Freeman. Aye. Um, Aye. Ian Golding. Aye. Jen Carberg. Aye. Joanna Roach. Aye. Joe Topham. Aye. And Mary Longacre. Aye. Thank you all. We'll see you in a few weeks. Thank, Thank you. you.